In part one, I talked about how merely rejecting a null value isn't enough. We really want an estimate of the parameter and a measure of the precision of that estimate. And then I talked about how frequentist confidence intervals don't really do the job for us. Then I talked about how Bayesian estimation works, and I was about to show you how precision is indicated in a Bayesian estimation, and that's what we'll do in the next slide. We'll zoom in on the posterior distribution on mu2. You can see marked in the distribution as a black bar the so-called 95% highest density interval. Points within the HDI have higher credibility, probability density, than points outside the HDI. The total probability of points within the 95% HDI is 95%. Now, the 95% HDI is a measure of the precision of the estimate. When that 95% HDI is narrow, we have a precise estimate. When it's wide, it's not a very precise estimate. Bayesian estimation provides explicit distributions for credible differences of means, differences of scales, and effect size. We compute the difference of means, the difference of the standard deviation or scale parameters, and the effect size at each of the many credible combinations. And here on the right, we see those posterior differences of means, differences of scales, and the effect size. Bayesian estimation supersedes the new statistics. It provides, that is, Bayesian estimation provides complete distribution of credible parameter values, not merely a point estimate with ends of a confidence interval. Bayesian estimation provides explicit precision on each parameter, on the differences, and the effect size, unaffected by sampling and testing intentions. And we here have a flexible descriptive model, which is robust to outliers, unlike the traditional conventional t-test. Now, what do you do if you really want to assess a null value? There are two Bayesian framings. One is Bayesian parameter estimation, in which a decision is made by the HDI and a rope. The other Bayesian framing is Bayesian model comparison, with a decision made by a Bayes factor. I'm going to explain these two in the next few slides. Consider making the decision by the posterior HDI and the rope. We consider a landmark parameter value, such as zero, a difference of zero, or it could be an IQ score of 100, but it's a landmark parameter value. Values that are equivalent to that landmark, for practical purposes, define the rope around that value. Remember, rope means region of practical equivalence. The rope is specified according to predictions of competing theories. It's routinely done in clinical equivalence testing, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. The roped parameter value is rejected if its rope excludes the 95% HDI, an example of which is depicted on the right. Notice this rejects the roped value, not the entire roped interval. The roped parameter value is accepted for practical purposes if its rope includes the 95% HDI as diagrammed here. Now, this accepts the roped value, not the entire roped interval. If the rope and the 95% HDI overlap, then we neither accept nor reject the roped parameter value. Here's an example of rejecting a null value. The data are shown in red histograms in the upper right. We zoom in on the difference of means, difference of scales, and the effect size. For purposes of illustration, the rope limits are set at defaults. Here, Cohen's 
so-called small effect size of 0 0.2. You can see in the lower right uh, distribution, the red vertical lines are marked at the rope limits of negative 0.2 and positive 0.2. For real research, we use predicted effect of smart drug based on previous drugs and on theory. But you can see in this case, in the lower right, the 95% HDI clearly falls outside the rope. The rope excludes the HDI. Here's an example of accepting a null value. Again, the data are shown in the upper right. Here, there's only a very small difference between the groups. Let's zoom in. In the lower right, here's the effect size. We see that the 95% HDI falls completely within the rope, and therefore we would accept the value of zero for practical purposes. The HDI with rope supersedes frequentist equivalence testing. Frequentist equivalence testing relies on the confidence interval, which, as we've seen, depends on sampling and testing intentions, and which does not specify the credible values of the parameter. The Bayesian HDI with the rope actually does what equivalence testing tries to do, in the sense of controlling meaningful precision, not in the sense of controlling false alarms. Here's a second way to use Bayesian analysis to address null values. We express the question as a comparison of a point null hypothesis model versus a distribution of possibilities model. Warning and apology, familiarity with Bayesian mathematics is assumed in the next few slides. Uh, you can learn about that in workshops I give or take a look at my book. At the bottom of this diagram are the data, D. The dashed rectangles indicate two different models of these data. Within each of those rectangles, we see the likelihood functions, that is, the probability of the data given the parameter theta in each model. Working our way up the diagram, within each model, we have a prior on the parameter in the model. On the top of this hierarchical diagram, we have a prior on the model index M. This is a categorical distribution expresses the prior probability of each candidate model. I've only shown two dashed rectangular boxes for two models, but there can be multiple models participating simultaneously in a single comparison. So the categorical distribution diagrammed at the top has three bars to suggest there could be multiple models. The focus is on the posterior distribution of the model index. We want to know, after we presented the data, what should we believe about the different models? Has the probability of one model index gone up and the other model index gone down? As I said, in Bayesian model comparison, the focus is on the model index, not on the parameters inside each model. So what we do is figure out for each model the probability of the data given the model, we collapse across the parameters inside each model. So on the left model, model 1, we compute the marginal likelihood of the data. That's the probability of the data given that the model is indexed 1. That's simply the integral of the likelihood times the prior on that parameter inside that model. We do the same thing for the other model. The marginal likelihood of the data for that model as the probability of data given that the model index is 2. The ratio of those two marginal likelihoods is called the Bayes factor. Now, the Bayes factor is what gets us from the prior distribution on those model indices to the posterior distribution. And the top now shows the posterior distribution across the nominal parameter M, the model index. 
if one model is much better than the others, as, as uh, indicated by the Bayes factor, if that ratio is greater than a critical value, we accept the best, we accept that better model. The critical value for the base factor is often taken as three, or if you're looking at the ratio the other way, it's one third. Now there's a special case of model comparison for null hypothesis testing. In this special case, the likelihood function is the same for both models. The only difference is the prior on theta. So you can see that diagrammed here at the bottom, within each model, we have the same likelihood, probability of D, given theta. The only difference is in the prior on theta. In null hypothesis testing, one of those priors is a spike prior on the null value, as shown in the left. Here we have a, a prior which is at zero everywhere on theta, except the null value of theta, where it's loaded up with um, the, all the mass right there at that spike. That expresses the null hypothesis. The other model expresses a range of possibilities on theta. So here I've drawn this broad distribution around the null value on theta. It could have different widths, different uh, central values, and so on. But the point is it expresses a range of possibilities under some alternative hypothesis. And now we just do model comparison on these two priors. The model comparison emphasizes the ratio of the uh, posterior probabilities of the model index shown at the top. If we're focused on the model comparison, we look at that Bayes factor, see if that ratio is greater than our critical value. However, as sh shown on the right, we could also look within the alternative model, look at the HDI on that parameter, and see how it relates to a rope around the null value. In other words, these two approaches, the model comparison base factor approach and the HDI uh, rope approach on the estimate of the parameter theta, they're taking place simultaneously in a unified hierarchical model. Please proceed now to part three.